Hi, this is Christy. The How to Love Lit podcast is a product of How to Love Learning, a registered 501c3 nonprofit committed to making English language literature equitable and accessible globally. If you're connected to an organization or company that would be interested in partnering or sponsoring educational ventures, please contact us at Christy at howtolovelitpodcast.com. I'd love to chat. Great things await. Hi, I'm Christy Schreiber, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Schreiber, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This is our second week in a two-part series discussing one of English language literature's most romantic couples, the poets Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Last week, we introduced Robert Browning and his notable dramatic monologue, My Last Duchess, which gives voice to a twisted psychopath, always a favorite. <laughs> we talked a little bit about Robert Browning's life, but not too much. And this week we'll return to his story as well as introduce his remarkable wife and her poetry, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And Christy, am I correct when I say that during their lifetimes, she was famous and he was the Mr. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, so to speak. And also my correct that the man who wrote about the most twisted love relationship in British poetry uh, arguably had one of the most famous personal love stories. Yes, you are correct on both accounts, although I will say in his defense, he did play second fiddle to Elizabeth during their lifetimes, but history has elevated him over the years, and you are correct on both accounts, although in his defense, I will say in regard to playing second fiddle to Elizabeth, he did that during her life, but... History has elevated him over the years. And been less kind to her. Am I right about that? Yes, at least for a while. The world turned on Elizabeth, or EBB, as she liked to sign things. Wait a minute. (laughs) EBB for Elizabeth Barrett Browning. She went by that? Well, uh, she did. She had a family nickname, actually, Bob. But in her professional life, yes, she had always signed everything EBB. But there's a story to that. When she was single, she was Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Barrett, so she started using EBB before she got married, and she just kept it up. You know, it avoided all the normal brouhaha confusion when women have to change their names if they get married later in life. It's it's such a hassle. But in her case, sticking with the initials just made it easy. I guess that worked out. Yeah, it did. But back to your point about history, it was rude to her, and I blame Virginia Woolf for that hundred years of bad-mouthing. She wrote a cruel essay, really, about EBB's most accomplished piece of poetry, a really long epic novel that was a poem called Aurora Lee. And Woolf, very condescendingly, for many reasons, but I think she just didn't like poetry, talked down about uh, Aurora Lee. And so Elizabeth just drifted on the coattails of her husband, ironically, because over that same period of time, his reputation just kept on going up. That was a giant reversal after their death. (laughs) I guess it's a good thing they were both gone. That could have brought some marital complications. (laughs) Or maybe they would have laughed. When they were alive, Robert Brown, he kind of took it in, in good humor once said that he could only get anybody to look at his work to publish it if he promised he could get elizabeth to print something with them as well so today though i will say after 200 years of dramatic back and forth we can be relieved to know that history regards both of them in high regard and they can just rest in peace that wolf crowd has settled down really and We can see EBB with a way more balanced perspective. Even her work, Aurora Lee, uh, something that is really more than we could handle in one episode. But I did want to mention it because it is considered to be uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's masterpiece and something that's really quite original, especially if you like things like epic poetry. You should check it out. Uh, I don't know that anyone else has ever written an epic poem about a female hero, not before or since. 
Uh, when it came out, it was extremely popular and also very scandalous. It's this plot-driven story, and one of the main characters, Marion er Earl, is a, um, a woman who gets raped, has a child, refused to hide the fact that this child was a product of the rape, and she doesn't even take a marriage proposal that would have redeemed her reputation as a fallen woman, so to speak. Uh, it was said that at the time, women read it secretly under their sheets so they wouldn't be discovered. Oh <laughs> and my. EBB loved that. <laughs> well, I'd say that's a very different hero than uh, Odysseus or Gilgamesh. And <laughs> I can see why Aurora Lee was so popular so quickly, not just in Britain, but also in America. I read somewhere that uh, they printed over 20 editions before the end of the 19th century. But let's back up and get a little bit of the backstory on this um, scandalous Victorian celebrity. <laughs> All right. Well, boring stuff first. EBB was born March 6, 1806. She was the eldest of 12 oh, children. My. And it was a prominent family. Her father's family, the Barretts, owned thousands of acres of sugar plantation in Jamaica, plus all the slaves that went with that. There's your controversy. The Barretts had gobs of money. So her early years were happy. And she lived in what, you know, kind of feels like a fairyland. Her father built this incredibly lavish estate. She could roam at will, and which is exactly what she did. Her family was somewhat progressive for the time. And they encouraged her, even supported financially her studying. She loved the study. She did it. She had this excellent high-end private tutor. She worked hard, even though for a woman, there really wasn't much point in learning a lot of stuff. But she received a classical education, and she became proficient in both Greek and Latin. And she read all the time. She had read anything and everything, and she could get her hands on quite a bit. She also got into poetry pretty early. She wrote for everyone all the time. Her father called her the Poet Laureate of Hope Inn. That was the name of this lavish estate. Hmm. He even sponsored the publication, if you can believe it, of her first epic poem when she was 13 years old. Well, I mean, can you imagine a proud father publishing his teenage daughter's epic poem? I mean, that's definitely a rich kid thing to do. Well, it certainly was an, an indication that life was just dreamy. Until it wasn't. <laughs> hmm. uh, first, the Barretts, and the, when I say Barretts, I mean the extended family. And I really don't understand completely what happened, but there's a, this obvious squabble about the plantation money. And somehow, I don't really understand how, but Elizabeth's dad lost a big chunk of it. So much so that out went the fancy estate, and all of a sudden they're living in some sort of temporary housing. And if that's not the worst of it, which, you know, that's overcomable... She had another big thing that happened around this same time, although lots of women had this during the same time in that era. She was sick. I mean, she was getting very sick all the time, and there was no obvious explanation. To this day, Elizabeth's illness is undiagnosed, but there's no doubt that she had all kinds of symptoms. She was weak to the point that she was literally physically disabled. Well, what did they say it was at the time? Uh, and as historians look back to the record, is there any idea today what made her sick? I know. Those are good questions. Uh, and, of course, her family tried everything. They moved to the seaside, which, you know, that's what they always do in British <laughs> literature. Even Emma did that. Uh, well, we see it in the book. But in her case, nothing improved her health. And so by the time she was 25, the family was back living in London. But, you know, that place at the time wasn't known for the, really? <laughs> the fresh air. Indeed. Think Chimney Sweeper or Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. But what happened to poor Elizabeth is because the air was so icky, she spent it basically all of her time confined in a bedroom at this very famous address, 50 Wimpole Street. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure about 50 Wimpole Street, but um, isn't 57 Wimpole Street where the uh, famous home of Paul McCartney was? The place where he and John Lennon wrote, I want to hold your hand, and then later yes, wrote yesterday? Today. Yes, it was. Oh, what a neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's a little bit after EDB's oh. stint there. But uh, they did make a fairly famous movie. She can be com I don't think she can compete with um, the Beatles, but they made a, a famous movie about Elizabeth Barrett Browning called The Barretts at Wimpole Street. 
So, you know, she's got stardom in her own right in that regard. But anyway, back to her health. Victorian London, general. Very smoggy, dirty. So she's locked up in her room, theoretically for her own good. Uh, there is a school of thought that suggests that some of her problems are connected to her spine from an injury that she got when she fell off a horse as a little girl. I don't know about that. There's also uh, a lot to say that she had serious problems with her lungs. Most of the best sources that I found suggest that she probably had spinal tuberculosis, but I really don't know what's wrong with her, except to say that by age 25, she's pretty much disabled and bedridden. And if that wasn't enough, and this also is a fairly common problem for the period, her doctors prescribed her meds, and you may can guess where this is going, that were addictive. And like so many back then, as well as today, she developed an addiction to opium, all under her doctor's care. This, of course, seems horrifying to me. That may be influenced by the fact that we just watched the Netflix series The Pharmacist and the expose on the opium addiction problem in America with Oxycontin and all the hundreds of thousands of overdoses that have to do with that. But Gary, clearly opium addiction isn't a 21st century phenomenon that we have just here. We talked about it a little bit with Frankenstein because it surfaced in that book. And although it's tangential, I think it's really interesting what can you tell us about opium addiction in the 19th century and how in the world would a little doted on homeschool girl wind up an opium addict? <laughs> sure. Uh, first, let's establish what it was that she was taking. Um, it was a common drug called laudanum, and she wasn't popping pills or shooting up or anything. Laudanum was an alcoholic uh, herbal preparation, and it was 10% opium, like a lot of over-the-counter things were then. It was prescribed pretty much for everything. It was used as a pain reliever, uh, a cough suppressant. Uh, it was used to control depression and heart palpitations. And uh, it was given as a sleeping pill. And it was given for menstrual cramps. And even worse than Oxycontin in the early days of the opioid, uh, opioid epidemic today, laudanum was an entirely uncontrolled substance. Almost no one uh, took the side effects of the drug seriously. And there were a lot of them, but another point to understand, and, and again, this is just like the opi opioids today, there was that uh, euphoria that was associated with it that people experienced from taking a drug, and that encouraged people to use it. And why not, right? It's not hurting anything, and it makes me feel good. And however, um, as we all know, um, drug euphoria comes at a cost, and the cost was depression and slurred speech and restlessness and poor concentration. And, of course, if you ever wanted to, to get off of it, there were terrible withdrawal symptoms. And uh, here's one crazy fun fact that might blow your mind. Laudanum was even spoon-fed to infants, if you can believe that. <laughs> oh, no way. But, yeah, they did. But before uh, we judge too quickly with the arrogance of the present, we have to remember that it wasn't even until 1899 that aspirin was invented. And these were days when there were just there were not antibiotics or mild tranquilizers and not much of anything. And people needed help and not just pain relief, but with all kinds of things. And this is what they had. So do you think that Barrett's prolonged disabilities could have been, you know, connected to the drug use? Oh, I'm sure it's possible. I mean, I really don't know, but uh, laudanum has no curative properties. Uh, after they got married, Robert Browning did help her reduce her drug use significantly. Um, and in fact, she reduced her dosage to the point where she was able to finally get pregnant after two miscarriages that were directly related to laudanum. And um, after marrying him, her entire health condition improved, actually. She even got to where she could walk again, but I'm not sure what all the factors were that contributed to her general improved health. She was definitely in a better climate and presumably a happy and true love. <laughs> yes. Uh, I do want to be clear. There was no stigma at that time in using laudanum. So we don't need to see her as a dark or unconventional, even because she was a laudanum user. I mean, lots and lots of people used for all kinds of things and lots were addicted including names we recognize, like a guy you might have heard of called Charles Dickens. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But anyway, let's move on to the love story. So Elizabeth was pretty much locked in her room, disabled, 
But honestly, otherwise, she was living a fairly engaging intellectual life. She was writing poetry. She was writing letters and basically managing an entire literary career out of a bedroom in this disabled state. In 1838, she published a book of poetry called The Seraphim and Other Poems. And that one met with a lot of critical success. And let me point out that Elizabeth Barrett Browning published her work under her own name. Not a lot of women were doing that at the time. But because her work was well-received and it was not anonymous, she had all this correspondence in the mail and she was making friends with really important literary figures of her day. Some of these people we've even heard of, people like William Wordsworth and Edgar Allan Poe. In 1844, she published another book of poetry that was even more successful. This was the publication that would change her personal life completely. In one of the poems in this collection, and the poem's name, if you care to know, Lady Geraldine's Courtship. But anyway, this poem has a reference to the poetry of a fairly obscure British poet of the time, a man by the name of Robert Brown. Hmm. <laughs> well, this obscure poet Robert was highly flattered to be noticed by someone as prominent as Elizabeth, and he wrote her a thank you letter, thanking for the shout out. However, this was not your run of the mill thank you letter. I don't want to read to you a part of it because it's kind of gotten famous. He says this, I love your verses with all my heart, Miss Barrett. I do, as I say, love these books with all my heart. And I love you too. <laughs> he didn't waste any time. Uh -uh. That is pretty forward. Uh, and Robert Brown, was very much a very bold suitor, no doubt. Um, he pursued Elizabeth and all through the mail. I was amazed to read that there are over 573 letters between these two. And these letters pretty much document the story of two people falling in love. Uh, you know, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan's email drama has nothing on these <laughs> two. Say. They wrote each other every day and seemingly pretty much about everything in the world. Uh, they were not Joey Tribbiani lines like, what's up? I mean... <laughs> These were full-on epistles. Well, the letters have been popular reading material ever since. And if you're interested in taking stalking to the next level and you want to stalk dead people, <laughs> um. you can really get an intimate look into these two people that were falling in love. Elizabeth called it talking upon paper. And when you read the letters, you can feel like you're injecting yourself because you are into... A private world. Yes, and you are mostly doing that. <laughs> I guess that's true, but it is sweet. Uh, here's a clip from a couple of, of the letters, and this is Elizabeth talking to Robert. You've come to me as a dream comes, as the best of dreams comes. And, of course, here's a line from Robert back, because he speaks to her just the same way. I have loved you all my life unawares. That is the idea of you. Oh, my. Well, that's a pretty special back and forth. And uh, that's been preserved. And they were clearly falling in love now before the eyes of the world and posterity. But we also see that Elizabeth was not totally sure marriage was the path for her. No, she really wasn't. And she had some serious hesitations, not the least of which was her father. He did not believe in allowing his children to get married, especially Elizabeth. None of the 12 of them? <laughs> no, and I mean like never. <laughs> They're a close family, and that kind of thing put her in a terrible position because to marry Robert would be to cut off her father, and she was close to her father. Uh, her relationship with her father was good, if you take out the tyrannical over-controlling thing. Hmm. <laughs> I know, it feels to say out loud, Tess. Well, and of course, we see uh, in the letters that Robert sent, obviously, he w was totally against this kind of control over her. Yes, and, and so that became a problem. But she had other concerns, too. I mean, she was really concerned about her disability, and she was concerned about her age. She was six years older than him. Uh, would it work? I mean, she was basically 40 years old when they got married. And I know 40 is the new 20 today, but she didn't feel that way. And she thought, you know, I'm past my prime. And there's insecurities about that. And, and we actually see these insecurities on paper in her love sonnets. 
But at the end of the day, Robert did love her and he wanted the relationship to work. So despite her father's objections, he visited her home 91 times, (laughs) unrelenting in wanting this relationship with Elizabeth. Gary, I know I asked, uh, you've read up a little bit on this. Do you have a theory on what uh, Mr. Barrett had against Robert or marriage in oh, general? Oh, my I mean, gosh. What's the, what's the problem? That we'd ha- that's very Freudian. We'd have to go <laughs> down that road. But uh, Well, for one thing, he thought Robert might be trying to use Elizabeth's fame for his own career. and I mean, that would be understandable. I guess, although for a 40-year-old, uh, today that seems her problem and not his. I don't think so. But the bigger problem was sex in general. Uh, from everything I've read, he was a good father and he loved his daughter. Um, Elizabeth, his bae, ba, however we're going to say that, in many ways, she was his pride and joy. And he struggled with his daughter having her own sexual identity because he had idealized her. Uh, it seems that as he got older, that sex part was just more than he could handle. <laughs> and this sort of thing happens even today with parents and children. Well, locking up the kid happens today, too, but it uh, it failed. <laughs> uh, that plan usually does. <laughs> yeah, because Robert and Elizabeth, they were in love. And so on September 12, 1846, with the help of her maid, because she had the problem that she couldn't move, Elizabeth manages to sneak out of the house and she marries Robert. Uh, One oddity, though, is that after they were married, she had to sneak back in and live there secretly until they could get their train tickets worked out. But they did, and they ran away to Italy and eventually settled in Florence, and that's where they lived for the rest of Elizabeth's life. One unfortunate fallout is that her father never got over the elopement. I mean, he disowned her. He cut her off financially, and he never spoke to her again. And uh, he would die never to see his daughter again. I mean, that's sad and also disordered. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure she probably knew that was a possibility and she had to calculate that in. Uh, it had to have hurt, but there's no indication that I have ever found that she regretted her decision. I mean, Italy was her choice. She loved it from her classical studies and the doctors told her that it would help her health, which it did. She also wanted Robert and a life with Robert. So Italy was the plan. And after three miscarriages, they had a son and she began walking again. And she got involved with European politics. She supported the unification of Italy. She took stands on women's right issues. She was engaged in life there, not just in a locked room. So in 1850, she published another collection of poetry. This one contained what she is most famous for, her sonnets from the Portuguese. Selections from this work is what we're going to read today. These were poems she wrote to Robert during those days when she was living locked up in the room on Wimple Street. She wrote 44 sonnets to Robert, but she didn't give them to him until after they were married. What is the connection with the Portuguese? (laughs) I know. Well, when they were dating, Elizabeth wrote a poem about a Portuguese girl named Catarina, uh, who was beloved. And Robert loved it, and he always connected Elizabeth to this fictional girl, Catarina. So when Elizabeth published these love sonnets, it kind of was an inside joke. The speaker is the Portuguese. It's her. And the poems are all love poems to her husband. Sonnets from the Portuguese. Hmm. You may also remember from Robert's life, I don't know if you remember this from um, the last episode, he had a really bad experience uh, writing from personal experience, these confessional poems. And so he had a little bit of PTSD there. And uh, so he encouraged her that he probably, she probably should put some distance between the author of the poem and the speaker of the poem. So she did, and she basically pretended that she translated the sonnets. I mean, it's a cute idea, but I don't think it was very well disguised. So she never (laughs) claimed to be able to speak Portuguese? I don't think so. Well, why are these love sonnets so popular? Well, good question. But one thing is they're just so, so sweet. And this love story is so well documented with these letters. The personal story about the sentiments that we already know about makes it somewhat charming. I mean... Elizabeth was 39 years old, and she considered herself past her prime when they met, and she was disabled. And she expresses uh, what to me seems like a disbelief that anyone 
uh, that she thought as amazing as this man she admired would really love her. And on his part, it's kind of a female fantasy. It's sweet against a lot of big obstacles. He made her believe he loved her because he did love her. He really did. And he was enamored with her and he admired her. And he thought, wow, how can a woman as brilliant as this woman really love me? And there we have something special. Yes. A mutual too. admiration <laughs> society. Uh, it's this mutual admiration that led to a real intellectual exchange. And in these letters, we watch this intellectual exchange develop uh, really into a uh, reciprocity of respect. And from this respect, we see trust. And then, then it moves on to intimacy. And, and all of this, of course, is exactly the kind of thing Ibsen advocates for in a doll's house. Well, and illustrates they don't <laughs> have it. Right. <laughs> The Brownings' relationship is the exact opposite of the Helmer marriage. Uh, The Brownings started as intellectual equals, but then they found their emotional connection. And after many months of back and forth and after many doubts, we finally land on those famous lines most of us recognize from the uh, grocery store Valentine Day cards that (laughs) young boys glue uh, on boxes of chocolates or put in the arms of teddy bears. The line, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I know. I really like Elizabeth, but I like Robert, too. I mean, he loved her for who she was, and he was bold. He took risks. This is something young men aren't really encouraged to do anymore. But for whatever reason, Robert demonstrated leadership in this relationship, and Elizabeth absolutely reciprocated the strength back to him. Sonnets from the Portuguese take us on her journey, and because we know the true story of their real-life romance— the sonnets are romantic and precious. Oh, well, you seem smitten, Christy. Should I be concerned? <laughs> or should I write sonnets? You should definitely write sonnets. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say, uh, there is more to appreciate about these love sonnets than just the element of the love confessional part. I'm not sure that would be enough to, to make him stay. But EBB was a rhetorician, and you know I love rhetoric. Mm-hmm. That's persuasion. And these poems don't just express emotion. They do make an articulate argument. She's making a statement, and it's interesting and it's relevant. Because Elizabeth was a product of the Victorian era. She had a very specific understanding of the view of the ideal woman of her day. However, that wasn't her. She was an intellectual, and her father had done her the disservice, I guess, (laughs) of introducing her to Greek and Latin philosophy. She was enamored with the female poet Sappho. So as she sat in that confining room on Whipple Street receiving letters from Robert after having received this really classical education, she found herself thinking, what does something like romantic love mean for somebody like me? I don't need a man for money. I don't need a man for a career. I mean, she really had both of those things. I don't even need a man for love. I mean, no one loved her more than her father in that kind of weird way. But what is romance? She thought about that. What is love? What is a relationship, a romantic relationship between a man and a woman? She sat around her room. She thought about those sort of things. And she had some conclusions. For one thing, she defines female love in a different way, and it isn't the same thing for her as masculine love, but it also isn't this frail, Victorian, helpless thing that, you know, was typical of the age. She defines feminine love in a strong way. For EBB, love comes from confidence and fills the lover with confidence, In the beginning in the sonnets, because there's a series of 44, we see a woman who was confident in her intelligence. She was confident in her work. She was confident in her family. But that did not translate into any kind of romantic confidence. And, you know, how many of us can relate to that? That was certainly me in high school and college, if I'm being totally (laughs) honest. Well, one thing that stands out to me is this idea of the frail female Uh, This was the ideal female for a lot of men at this time period in the Victorian age. And, uh, of course, most men even today want to be strong for a significant lover or the love of a woman in general. But this dramatic idea of the sickly and frail woman is very typical of that Victorian age. 
Uh, I can see that a woman expressing some powerful confidence was not something people expected from a female in a uh, romantic relationship and certainly not in a female romantic figure. Well, that's exactly. And what's so ironic about that is she could have pulled off the sickly thing because she was sick, but she didn't want somebody to love her for that. She ran from that. In fact, she even ran from being appreciated for being a woman in general. Uh, When Woodsworth died, England needed a new poet laureate, and Elizabeth's name surfaced because she was a woman. The argument was that there should be a woman poet laureate for the nation because there was a woman monarch. Well, Barrett took issue with that whole idea, and she made the statement that she was not a poetess. She was a poet. And she thought poetry should be judged by its merits and not by the sex of the writers. <laughs> oh, it's nice to know that some things never change, right? I mean, 19th century cross-sectional politics. I know, right? But this is why I bring it up. When it came to her poetry, she didn't want to be looked at as a woman in this hyphenated subgroup. She saw that kind of thing patronizing, kind of like how boys talk about girl athletes when they say things like, well, she's pretty fast for a girl. (laughs) I mean, that's not Elizabeth's thing. That's why she didn't have a pseudonym like George Eliot or Emily Bronte, who went by Ellis Bell. Hiding uh, your gender professionally was totally acceptable at the time, but it wasn't the statement that EBB wanted to make. She's more of the line of, I'm a woman, I know that. I have the feelings and desires that define me as a woman, and I will write about women, about what women care about, and I will show how I, as a woman, see the world, and I can stand confidently shoulder to shoulder with any man on this. And this is an important thing to do, so don't patronize me by qualifying me by gender. I define my femininity for myself. But... That only applied to outside relationships. It was a little different when it came to the romantic, personal ones. I was going to say, how does it apply to personal relationships? I know. It doesn't ever apply the same. I mean, it seems crazy and unlikely, but somehow uh, she and Robert got on the same page in their understanding of how men and women should relate. He wasn't intimidated by her professional success at all, and he probably should have been. I mean, she was well known. He was not. Their personal relationship was theirs. She was a woman who wanted to be desired, to be cherished, to be loved and adored, and he wanted very much to do all those things for her. So they had a very traditional relationship, maybe Victorian, but I have to be honest, I love those kind of things too. (laughs) (laughs) So as we read these poems, uh, we want to see a powerful woman writer, but also a dreamy, love-struck woman. As the prisoners think of liberty, as the dying think of heaven, so I think of you. That's another line from one of her letters to Robert. Uh, But in this line, we can see a brave but smitten female voice. (laughs) So you're saying um, she's not writing as someone trying to be coy or silently waiting to be seduced. Right. She didn't want to play that game. She does want to be seduced, but she's dropping all that silent coy stuff. Sonnets from the Portuguese are in sequence. They take us through her evolution of thinking and her emotions on her experience of falling in love. In Sonnets 1 and 2, we get to see the woman speaker as object of the man. She's not the creator of her poetic voice yet. And this, of course, is what we think of when we think of traditional love poetry. Man loves woman. Man speaks. Woman stays silent. You know, think about the conventions of sonnets in particular. Think about Petrarchian sonnets. That's exactly what those were about. Now, uh, we don't need to uh, rehash our entire episode on Petrarch, although he's worth listening to if if you haven't listened to that podcast, (laughs) or at least not in a while. Uh, But by way of reminder, uh, Petrarch wrote sonnets to a woman named Laura who did not return his affection. Uh, The entire genre of the Petrarchan sonnet is about really objectifying women. And in fact, I'm pretty sure Petrarch never really refers to Laura as a whole human being. It's references to her hair, to her, her breasts, her voice her smile, and even her name, Laura. And some people think that just stands in for the word Laurel. You're right. Laura is distant. (laughs) She's impersonal. She's an ideal. And the sonnets are mostly about Petrarch, the man. They're not even about her. 
But Elizabeth is not just going to reverse this. She's going to redefine the sonnet genre entirely. She's going to say this. I'm the object. Yes, I want to be the object. But I'm also the speaker. I'm not silent. I am a recipient of a love that empowers, but I'm also the giver of that love that emboldens. The poetic relationship in these sonnets is reciprocal. His love calls for her poems, but she writes them. So in a sense, he is a magic prince who kisses and restores her. She sees him like this, but she's not weak and she's not powerless. Even in her physical frailty, even in her age, she did not see herself uh, in this way, even though she was physically for her uh, past her prime. She wasn't past her prime creatively or professionally. So she's the creator of the art here. She's creating this new idea that I can be the muse for the love and the creator of the art. Well, is it safe to say that Robert is a muse also? I think you can say that. Okay. Uh, I also want to point out uh, that in their relationship, you know, it's intellectual, but it's definitely not platonic. It's romantic. And there's a little bit that gets physical here, slightly erotic. We won't read those. He was bold towards her and she's bold back. <laughs> bulge back. Well, this could get interesting. I think so, but you can read those by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to read uh, three of her sonnets, correct? Correct. I want to. I think it's nice to try to see a little bit of the progression we're talking about, how they kind of show her evolving into this understanding of her relationship. I know uh, it's we're going on and on, so I don't want to overdo the analysis thing because there are three of them. So we'll try to enjoy them, you know, more holistically. We'll start with fourteen, then go to twenty-two, but we can't leave without reading the famous forty-three, the one that everybody knows. So we'll start with sonnet fourteen. If thou must love me, let it be for naught, except for love's sake only. Do not say I love her for her smile, her look, her way of speaking gently, for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine, and search brought a sense of pleasant ease on such a day. For these things in themselves, beloved, may be changed, or changed for thee, and love so wrought may be unwrought so. Neither love for me, thine own dear pities wiping my cheeks dry, a creature might forget to weep who bore thy long comfort and lose thy love thereby. But love me for love's sake that evermore thou mayest love on through love's eternity. Uh, don't know how well I read that as far as the uh, you know true poetic reading goes, but it seems pretty straightforward and easy to understand for me. Well, it is. Uh, just to give a little introduction to the form, notice that it's in iambic pentameter, but um, but um, but um, five strong beats uh, in every line, just like every other, well, most every other sonnet in the world. And just like Petrarch did, there's a rhyme scheme A B B A, A B B A, C D, C D, C D. But that's as far as she's going to go with the old Petrarch model. In fact, she's responding to Petrarch Don't love me like Petrarch loved Laura. He loved her for stuff, her smile, her look, her way, all that garbage. Don't even love me for cute things I say or what you do for me or how it makes you feel to do stuff for me, like wiping tears from my cheeks, all that nonsense. I'm just not interested. If we're going to do the love thing, we need to get past all that and figure out something much deeper. The smile and tears stuff isn't enough. Love me for love's sake that evermore thou mayest love on through love's eternity. Well, <laughs> it is a very ornate style, um, and it's understandable in light of what we know about her uh, personal underconfidences that she would talk like this. But like I said before, I really enjoy seeing a mature woman experience uh, a deep and intimate love, and she's allowing herself to enjoy all the emotions of love, like most people associate with you. But it's not immature love. Um, it establishes really reciprocal terms. Yes. Another point I want to make before we read the next one, and this may be uh, one of the reasons her poetry was ill-received in the 20th century. EBB had no trouble exploring her doubts and her underconfidences in her romantic relationship. As we see that here, although the earlier ones had more of it, she seems slightly concerned that if the love relies too much on the physical, it might be a bust. 
And, you know, fem- feminist critics of the 20th century didn't like that. They said things like, she's lowering herself in this relationship when she should be promoting herself. Uh, and maybe there's a sense that that's true. She clearly submits to Robert in these sonnets on purpose. But uh, here's the difference that I think has since redeemed her. It's a reciprocated submission. It's not something that Robert himself uh, isn't doing also. So today, as we read her poems, we aren't really offended by all this vulnerability. In fact, the honesty has been uh, reinterpreted as confidence because it takes you know sincerity and confidence to be open about what you're underconfident is is paradoxical. I know <laughs> that may sound. Of course, I agree with that. And, and I have to think from a psychological point of view that being in love and writing about how it makes you feel at age 39, as opposed to age 19, is uh, probably why she can be vulnerable about her self-doubts without really coming across as weak and pitiful. She's already been through the adolescent stuff as a totally separate issue. So um, as she tries to understand what about love is overwhelming her and making her feel so differently, she can really separate what is unique about this particular love relationship from regular developmental issues of underconfidence or or even the loving relationship she's already experienced from her family, which we have to remember, she'd been adored her entire life. <laughs> I know. Let's read 22. Well, we can see here that the tone has shifted. There's been a progression from love me for love's sake to when we stand erect. The posture is very different. So let's read that one. When our two souls stand up erect and strong, face to face, silent, drawing nigh and nigher, until the lengthening wings break into fire, at either curved point, what bitter wrong can the earth do to us that we should not long be here contented? Think, in mounting higher, the angels would press on us and aspire to drop some golden orb of perfect song into our deep, dear silence. Let us stay rather on earth, beloved, where the unfit, contrarious moods of men recoil away and isolate pure spirits and permit a place to stand and love in for a day with darkness and the death hour rounding it. Well, again, uh, you know, we have the same iambic pentameter, the five strong beaks in every line, ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. Uh, we have the rhyme scheme, A-B-B-A, A-B-B-A, C-D, C-D, C-D. Uh, But uh, what we notice more than the rhyme change is the tone change. And this is kind of traditional. In the Petrarchan sonnets, the first eight lines set up a question and the second six lines answer it. They call it the turn. But in this one, the first eight lines or the octave are going to define the status of their love as it is now. And the last six will argue quite untraditionally that they need to stop time and just stop, just stay in this present moment. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to do? (laughs) Oh, I know. Uh, But I guess it's a nice sentiment and it's unrealistic nature. Uh, And, you know, why she's enjoying it. I want to point out, again, how much religious imagery she throws in here. It's not two bodies, it's two souls. And they're not constrained by physical restraints anymore. Something you know, she was really familiar with. I also want to point out how equal the two people in the poem are. They're two souls erect and strong, face to face with ring wings breaking into fire. I mean, that's some pretty cool imagery. It's, you know, think about the mythical phoenix full of power and energy. And yet cool as they would be, I would prefer to just stay here in this moment with you is what she's saying. As cool as all that is. It's sweet. All right, the last one. This is the famous one, Sonnet 43, the second to last poem in the entire series. And in many ways, it's the concluding one. In this one, she's going to summarize some of the arguments she's made throughout the other sonnets. She's going to catalog the eight ways of loving that she's been making for the last 42 sonnets. So let's read it and see how the famous love story ends. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being in ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. 
I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. By the end of EBB's sonnet sequence, she has reshaped her understanding of love. She had allowed herself to express her initial insecurities. She'd walked us through her doubts and developed before us a full and complete discovery of what her romantic relationship means. Again, she's using the same iambic pentameter, ba-dum, 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 the same ABBA, ABB, A, C, D, C, D, C, D, you know, rhyme scheme. It's just very simple. It's all very obvious. It's very confident. Where in the first one we read, there was a lot of insecurity. And the second one, this confident equality. In this one, we see her leading. Basically, she's saying, okay, I'm ready. Let's <laughs> elope. <laughs> well, I guess she is. Um, again, there's a lot of uh, religious and Christian imagery. It even alludes to the Bible. And the language borrows from St. Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, where he describes Christ's love for humanity. Right, and that's on purpose. Um, she's expressing the completeness here. In every line, she's showing us this cycle. There's spiritual love, everyday love, free in society love. There's virtuous love, passionate love, permanent love. But then she finally gets to eternal love after death. Well, how does their story end? It's nice. Uh, first of all, and I forgot to tell you, they nicknamed their son Pen, as in what you write with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's cute. Uh, after the elopement and they moved to Italy, there was, they had 15 years together before Elizabeth's health finally gave out. Uh, the story goes that on the day Elizabeth died, Robert lifted her up towards him and she kissed him repeatedly, even kissing the air after he put her back on her bed. And Robert was heard saying, beautiful, beautiful. And after she breathed her last breath, he looked at her and said, how she looks now, how perfectly beautiful. And this was June 29, 1861. That autumn, Robert and Penn, they left Florence, never to return. He prepared and published her last works, and he titled them Last Poems. I really think he was unselfishly pleased that even after her death, sales of her work still far exceeded his. But... Uh, Robert Browning stayed in England. Gradually, he established a place in London society. This is unfortunate. Uh, he proposed to another woman named Louisa, Lady Ashburton. She was rich and attractive, a widow. However, uh, he blew the proposal so badly that <laughs> <laughs> on the basis of that, she turned him down. Uh, yeah, you know, bad proposals are some of the things that uh, America's Funniest Home Videos really taught us all to enjoy. But uh, how was his so bad? I mean, he was a poet. You'd think he could really turn a <laughs> phrase. I know, you'd think he could. Uh, but this stands out, I think, among the long line of bad proposals. He literally told her that his heart lay buried with his life in Florence, and he really just wanted to marry her for the advantages it would give Penn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, at least he was honest. I know, just honest and single. <laughs> I mean, he continued to write and publish all the way until he died, and he died in the same country as his wife, by the way. He and his sister were vacationing in Venice, and he had bought a house there for Penn, and while he was in Venice, he caught a cold and died on December 12, 1878. So today, EBB is buried in Florence, but not Robert. They shipped his body uh, back to England, and it, he got a very prestigious spot. Today, he's in Westminster Abbey. <laughs> well, I mean, that's impressive and an interesting ending to a famous romance. Unless you believe Elizabeth and it doesn't end. She was going to love him better after death. <laughs> True. Well, there you go. Perhaps uh, she set those wings on fire. Oh, my. We've been reading too many sonnets this week. But anyway, next week, we're changing gears entirely. If you're listening to this in real time, it's October 2021, Halloween season. So we will be starting The Haunting of Hill House by American Shirley Jackson. It's not my favorite some genre, 
But here we go into the scary yes. stuff. <laughs> well, thanks for listening. Uh, and please know that we appreciate you spending time with us each week. We hope you're enjoying exploring the classics with us. And if so, please help us by tweeting an episode, posting a link on Facebook or LinkedIn, or simply texting an episode uh, to a friend. If you're a teacher, visit our website for teaching support. We have now covered over 40 authors and lots of information on our website uh, for that can be used in the classroom. Once again, thanks for being with us. Peace out.